This is like breaking news here. This is like a great newsworthy piece for us. Like the young climate activists, the people changing the world, this is what they're watching after they go home from oh, yeah. the march. Welcome to our second episode of Bespoke. I am absolutely thrilled today and excited to welcome an exceptional guest, Jerome Foster. He is the founder and co-editor-in-chief of The Climate Reporter and the founder and executive director of One Million of Us. Welcome, a huge welcome to Jerome. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be on, on here with, with Brandon Maxwell. Such an accomplished and iconic fashion designer and to have a in, in great conversation about like the activism world and how really America and the world are changing right now. Um, so yeah, I'm the executive director of One Million of Us, which is a youth boy organization that's all about the intersections of activism. Um, I started out as an environmental activist, and through my, I interned at Congressman John Lewis, I was able to broaden my understanding about activism, and understand that it's about climate justice, immigration reform, gender equality, racial equality, all these movements coming together to fight for the same justice, to really transform our power from the streets and take it to the poll this November and really have our generation step on the political stage. I'm probably more excited about this than anything. I've been counting down the days until you uh, came on here. And I just want to say first and foremost how grateful and thankful I am that you have agreed to share your time with us. I know how busy you are changing the world. And so I just feel very thankful that you've taken the time to come on. We met each other through the internet like many people do. We were actually, I think, mentioned in one of the same articles and then you tagged me and then I went down a rabbit hole of all of your accomplishments <laughs> and watched every YouTube video. So you went to high school in Washington, DC. You, for a solid year, every weekend, went out in front of the White House and did a climate strike every single weekend. You took classes in the summer at Harvard. You, as you said, interned for Congressman John Lewis. You started The Climate Reporter. And now you have started One Million of Us, which is this sort of youth-led advocacy organization that is rallying one million young people to vote in the 2020 election. So your accomplishments are long. When I spoke to you the first time, you know, physically, I went to my office and I said, I just have a feeling I'm talking to the future president of the United States. Do you have any plans to run for political <laughs> office in the future? I know that that's many years away, but yeah. any any plans? Um, I get this question a couple times. Um, and my, my, always my response is just that we look to young people to be like the next future and like to run for office. But like for me, I do see that as my future, but right now I want to focus on the politics of today and really meet with elected officials because whenever I meet with elected officials, like we met for the the Youth Climate March and met with elected officials and said, oh, you're going to be the next president or the next congressional member. But I'm like, we need to believe in the politics of today before we can believe in the politics of our future. And like, I always put into the fact that like, we have to make sure that politicians are being community members as well, that they're community organizers. And that if I'm not the correct community organizer for my my community, then I feel like they should be the um the public policy champions. It's not just anyone who's out here who has a platform. It's I feel like for me, I I, I might be good good at that as I get older. But right now, I just see myself doing the work that I, that, I, that I see organizing my generation to turn out to vote. That was a very good political answer. I can see <laughs> you having a future. Talk to me a little bit about your history. And you know what got you involved in activism, and what is making you so passionate about voting, and what do you specifically want people in your generation to know as we are sitting here thirty days out from an election? Yeah, I think that really the story of, of Gen Z and millennials is that we were born into a lot of these crises that we're that we're experiencing now, like the climate crisis. People say, "Oh, it's our children's children that are being impacted by it," but it's Gen Z that's being impacted by it right now, and I think that. For so long, like I started at activism being a journalist, building virtuality environments um, in ninth grade, trying to figure out ways to engage people. But then as I got older and older, it was like, no one's paying attention. Like we're, we're marching in the streets, thousands of people are marching in the streets and po no policies are being made. So out 30 days out from the election, I really urged us to, to look, think back to the moment when we begged our parents to go vote for us, vote for the issues of climate justice and racial, racial reform. And figure that right now we have to rely on ourselves because we're the generation that's now stepping on the political stage. We make up 40% of the electorate this election cycle. And we have the power to really sway the election. Like in 2016, 
the 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 presidency was was basically determined by one or two votes per precinct. So that means if you got you and two of your friends to go out to the polls, you could have swayed the election. So it means that like every single vote matters. Every single person in any state really matters because of the fact that you're still showing, even on a local level, that you're active, that you're political, and that you're paying attention. Really what, what started um, be, my interest in politics was I was in high school and they had like a community service opportunity for um, from my principal and we could intern for the D.C. State Board of Education. Um, had a high school graduation requirements task force. We're just really revamping the high school graduation requirements for the class of 2030. So I was a part of that task force and just helped to really look at what the future would look like in Washington, D.C. if we just prioritized young people's um, civic education and technological education. Um, and that kind of really saw like how a direct young person could have an impact. Um, yeah, after that in 10th grade, I, I just saw like other things to do. I just kept doing it. And after I did that, I was like, oh, we actually changed the high school graduation requirements. I didn't think that could happen. So then afterwards, I joined as an intern for Citizens Climate Lobby, which advocated for the Clean Energy DC Act, which at the time was the most aggressive decarbonization bill. And we were in, there was like me and my friends who were there testifying for seven hours and like all the co council members were there trying to strike this bill down because of the most aggressive climate bill. And at that time, everyone was like, climate change is a hoax. And after we talked for so long, the, all the congressional members unanim unanimously supported it. And it was at, at the hand of like Pepco, like of Exxon Mobil, all the big devils at the, the fossil fuel industry came up behind us and, and we're like, uh, we're, we're against these young people, but I, I guess we're, we're going to champion this, this policy as well. And I really saw that like young people have a power because every time I met with like an official, they showed that like young people, when we unite and we vote and when we just turn out, we're always seen as having the moral high ground because we don't have an alternative agenda for money or power. We're just here to save our, safeguard our future and safeguard our lives because we're growing up in the system and eventually we're going to take power. So we might as well figure out how that power works now. What are the core issues that you think young people are going to the polls caring deeply about right now? I believe that the three biggest things are the, are the climate crisis and racial inequality and also gun violence prevention. A lot of people don't understand the mindset of our generation. There's a lot of anxiety because as we grew up, we were born a year after 9-11 or around that time frame. And during that time, every single book we read about our own planet or every single documentary we watched had an ominous ending about the fact that our planet is self-destructing, really. And it was, it was that feeling of, well, the adults will get it, they'll handle it. And then slowly as that naivety faded and like as we got older, it was replaced with like the sense of urgency that like we have to stand up or no one will will come to actually safeguard it. Like we have to be our own saviors at this point because no one goes into a war sending middle schoolers and high schoolers going out and climate striking to do this. So it's us like growing up to the climate crisis and growing it. Like I had a conference call with like one man I was organizers a couple of weeks ago and I was like, how, what is your guys' relationship with like gun violence? And all of us were able to say that in our school, there was a person who went on social media and joked about the fact that he was going to shoot up our school. And it was just normal that it happened so frequently that it just became like, oh, that's what everyone goes through. And with racial inequality, that's just like a whole other story. Like, I just remember, like, every time I was sitting in the car with my mom, she would say, pull out your phone, pull out your phone, pull out your phone right now. And I'm like, what's going on? She's like, just record, record. And then afterwards, she would say, she would tell me why. I'm going through that and like why she asked me to record her when she's getting pulled over because there's been so many instances of like my direct family members being racially profiled and actually being sent to jail for no reason and it was it's that normalization of the erosion of our rights as we got older just really amplified and just created this momentum that if we don't act, we aren't going to get anything. We aren't going to, we are going to have a safe future. We're going to have a safe planet. We're going to have safe communities and we're going to have an immoral society. So what we are rising up and doing is saying that this is an intersectional movement. We have to unite and not just segment our different movements. Like LGBTQ rights are intersectional with black rights because we're seeing black trans women being disproportionately killed by, by police brutality. And when we, when we, continue to to create bridges between these movements we're more powerful because of it and i think that's what motivates young people because we're seeing that like as long as we band together we're gonna see these these issues resolved and that's i think 
the 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 change that we're seeing in young people right now. We're coming of age. We're understanding the realizations of voting, and we're we're understanding our power. And it's like this is my first time voting this year, so it's like really great to to be a part of the generation that's that's able to really come of its own. Like when I was six years old, my sister was voting for the first time for Barack Obama, and I was putting in yard signs. I was like. I was going through and putting Obama yard signs in, in different people's home, in front of different people's homes. And now it's great to actually have that full circle moment where my sister's like helping me to, to prepare to vote. So when I, you know, worked on a campaign about almost 12 years ago, pretty extensively when I was right out of school, not far from your age, it was a life changing experience for me because not only was there so much, you know, hope in the air, but also I felt that I really had my future. Like when I went in and voted, like I was voting for my future and the things that I cared about. And that vote could advocate for all the things that mattered to me. You know, I want to talk about what one million of us is doing for, you know, to get people out to vote and the most important things that we can do. But we have one day, one day, and you cannot wake up on that day and decide you don't feel like it. You'd rather do something else because that one day, that one vote affects things for lifetimes. One of the big caveats I want to say is that one million of us due to COVID-19, we're not able to reach our one million goal because we had a bus tour, we had a march, we had TED Talks, local things we were doing all throughout the year that were canceled um, to do this, but we are still reaching out to as many people as possible. Um, but one of the big things that we do do is um, in National Voter Registration Week and in the past weeks, we have voter ed education resources. So you can register to vote and what we send you are huge amounts of resources to you can sign up to, to have a 50 percent off ride to the polls on Election Day through Lyft. You can make have um, have vote by mail um, talk to you through video because I didn't even know how to mail a ballot. None of my friends do. None of my roommates do. Yeah, <laughs> we don't know how to mail at all. Like we never mail anything. So we have to like make videos teaching ourselves how to mail. So like we produce that as well. Um, we also have videos to walk you through um, for disabled communities. We send you um, a phone, um, we send you a box where it helps you to understand the ballot process. And also we give you a phone number to call. Um, if you're unable to understand the ballot for any reason, you can call that number and help you through the election process. Um, and I urge people to vote early and vote by mail um, because of the fact that on election day, we're going to see a lot of changes and in, in the fact that like this election is very different. The, the best thing to do is to vote early and to vote as soon as possible because of the fact that like we're going to see a lot more processing due to the, 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 the changes that have happened this election season. Um, but I think that what one made of us is, is, is in its core is providing resources for young people, educating them and providing them with a lot of video resources. And also we all, we're very different from other voting organizations because we take the, what other organizations call risk. We partner directly with organizations like Black Lives Matter, like March for Our Lives, like Fridays for Future to directly have GOTV resources at these marches and, and protests to make sure that people aren't just yelling and then not going to the polls. We want to make sure that they're using both their civic voices and their 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 protest voices as well. So we we work with them directly, and that's really changed a lot of how we reach out to people because it's all they're already activated and they're already excited. So once you register to vote through us, you're able to get resources to other marches and other ways to be civically active. Whether that's chalk the vote that we've been doing across New York City all this week. Um, whether that's um, prom at the polls, an issue that we're starting to really bring joy to the election and post your old prom photos or make new prom videos of you dressing up to vote to walk down to the polls. And also we're making the first ever virtual reality event on the second weekend of October, um, the first ever virtual reality rally to bring young people together and really have a conversation about how we're coming into our power, how we're going to unite to vote this election season, and what we're going to do after the election. Are we just going to vote this time and never going to vote again? Like, we got to continue to vote over and over again and vote in local elections, vote for county sheriff, vote for all the things that are important in our government to make sure that we're active citizens and understand what's going on in our democracy. Are you hopeful about where we're going as a country? Do you feel that we are heading into a good spot? Yes, absolutely. Um, I When I... To use the word hope, it gives a lot of people different understandings of what I'm talking about. So with me, I just feel optimistic about what our future is going to be. And I know that really the hope comes from action. So I'm excited that we're, that we've registered to vote. We have so many young people activated in the streets. Like if you go on social media, everyone's talking about voting. Everyone's talking about being civically engaged. But I'm scared of this lull period that we're in. We've registered to vote. And over these next two, three weeks, 
we have really almost nothing to do except register, register and actually go vote now. So I'm trying to make sure that like our generation doesn't like have short attention span, just go off and not do anything. So we're trying to continue this this momentum because we we're at the last final stretch. We can't just like sit down and be the turtle, like the turtle in the hair that just like sits down and takes a nap at the end. Like we got to keep doing this and conti- continue this movement and and really power th- power through. So I'm excited about where we are and what we've achieved so far, but we have so much more to go because we want to make sure that it, it's too big to rig. We want to make sure it's, it's young people are turning out in massive numbers so that we make sure that, our, that we have the outcome that we look for. Yeah, of course. And then beyond that, you know, if hopefully your elected official, your chosen elected officials are, uh, you know, put into office that of course it's like you know holding them accountable their entire term to yeah. you know really make sure that they are driving home the issues and addressing the issues that you know you voted them in office for i think that that's one thing yeah. that people don't really remember is like we sometimes in elections say like okay if we put this person in they're going to solve the problem and the truth is nobody in politics is perfect politics is not perfect one thing i think that stops people from doing things is they're like oh i can't balance all of that or i can't do all of that i mean you're a freshman in school right now which is traditionally the most challenging time because you're getting adjusted it's a new time and you're also you know getting a huge organization off the ground talk to me a little bit about balance and where you put your priorities and how you you know, keep all of that going. And do you have time for a social life? I guess so. Yeah, my social life is just people that are within the organization, but it's healthy. We're all like good friends. But I think that in general, when it comes to like balancing things and in, in like young people in general, like mental health is like a big issue. Like anxiety is like the thing that holds a lot of us back. Like me and Greta Thunberg had like this similar experience of like, we understood what climate change was, what her, her reaction was a lot more severe than mine, but she took a whole year of like not talking and not being able to utter her disappointment in other generations. I think that's an entire thing that we're seeing on social media now is is climate anxiety, racial anxiety, and and just an anxiety of our future. But I think that what what, what's changing is that we we the main reason main source of our anxiety was helplessness. Now we felt like we couldn't change anything. But now we aren't as helpless as we are now because of the fact that we're getting older and are able to impact things. Um, But yeah, it's and generation wide thing. Like I've talked to so many high schoolers and college students about like how do we how do we balance the social life? How do you balance trying to fight for justice? How do you balance also trying to get a job too? <laughs> like all those things, trying to prepare for your future is kind of hard because me, I never actually that was my first goal wasn't to be an activist. I kind of went through activism as like over the years of like gradually becoming more active. My main I'm I'm studying in college, I'm majoring in computer science, specializing in artificial intelligence. Like my main passion is coding. Um, but now it's like all every activist you talk to, uh, they're fighting for any movements. They've had like this original passion when they were younger, but then like as they got older, we're like, oh, we gotta due to like mental health things, I got so anxious that I felt like I had to get in the fight to to fight for our future. You know, this has to be a very just with what's going on in the world in general already has to be very confusing um, and sort of anxiety inducing. But, you know, you've also, the majority of students have been out of school, you know, for the past six, eight months, and you're not able to be as social as much. Um, Do you think, you know, first of all, how is your mental health during this time? And do you feel that there is um, a sense of despair and apathy or do you think that seeing all of these things happening, you know, because I think we have sort of two routes. We can sit around and say how bad everything is and doesn't this feel like the world is ending? Or we can say, oh, this is an opportunity for us to stop and see what's not right and change it. You know, do you mm. feel yourself yes. personally and your friends around you are feeling more that? Or is it a sense of, you know, sort of hopelessness? People are either becoming much more involved or not being involved at all. And like, it's that stratification that's really dividing our, our generation around like, how do we react to like this political climate? What most commonly when I talk to people that are voter apathetic is, it's not that they don't understand how their vote is impactful, but they understand the full scope of it. They understand what is really needed to, to tackle these crises. And they're just pessimistic about whether we can get there. And I think through having conversations and talking about the small pieces to fix the problem, like implementing a carbon tax, like retrofitting our buildings, like making sure that we don't incentivize um, the production of coal-fired power plants in black and brown communities. It's it's that it's those those small steps that we talk through is really changes the 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 conversation. And I think that also it's it's the perpetuation of like generations of of of, 
of suppress voter suppression. Like there's been so many things to be like, oh, people have died for this. Um, why do I want to go through that same thing? It's just connecting and understanding your small part, your small piece of this puzzle. And I think that is voter apathy isn't isn't that they don't care. It's just that they understand it to a, a different extent and have a different perspective. Are there resources? Are there places you can go to say to research like these are things that really matter to me? Like how does this affect me? You can go to one million of that us backslash edu and find a lot of resources that can help you to find your place in these movements and understand like how, how do I understand about climate change? How do I understand about LGBTQIA issues? And how do I figure out how to help these movements? How do I get involved? Like I am in Portland, Oregon, and I don't know how to become a volunteer firefighter in my community. Um, and I want to learn how to do that. We have those resources for you to be a part of that community and make sure that you're, that you're safe and, and are able to be a part of it. So I think voting is such an just a happy, exciting thing, you know? And yes. I'm, I'm so, so um, excited by the idea of Prom at the Polls, which is an initiative that you were launching around voting day. You know, so many young people didn't get the experience of Prom this year, which is a transformative, fun experience. There are pictures that, you know, it's a great moment, but it's also pictures that laugh, last a lifetime and you can look back and laugh at um, forever. Yeah. Like me, where I wore a banana yellow um, tuxedo with ruffles, and I had blue hair and a double chin. So that's been fun to look at my whole life. So Prom of the Polls as a campaign launched on National Voter Registration Day. And really to get involved is to post a video of your friends using our AR filters on Instagram or Snapchat, or just making a video of yourself going out to the polls and, and showing your ballot. Um, and that can be early voting like right now or mailing in your ballot, like walking to the mailing location. And we just want you to dress up and be in your formal attire, going with your loved one or your friends, all going to the polls and like having a good time and like showing how like this is going to be like a great occasion for us because we didn't have that prom early this year. And we want to really relive that and have our redemption prom this time around. And really, we're, you can do that. And also on November 1st. Um, we're going to have a massive live stream with musicians, celebrities, influencers from all across the gambit to turn out for a long live stream to really get involved and create a, a magical event for us. 100%. Okay, so just side note, what will you be wearing on Prom at the Polls? Have you oh. put your outfit yet? Well, hopefully I'll be wearing Brandon Maxwell. Okay, well, there you go. I, yes, I, I, yes. I know the person who can make that happen. I'm sure he's happy to accommodate. All right, last two. I have just two more. Is this too long for you? I'm sorry, I have two more. Oh no, you're fine. I have nothing okay. to do. Like, I can't. That's why I'm so rattled because I had to cancel everything because it's raining. Community, community. Prom at the polls. Getting out together. I've seen you with Jane Fonda, Greta Thunberg. Yeah. Um, talk to us just about you know looking around in the world and coming together with people. Like, don't you think it's it's so much more fun to to you know Absolutely. fight for change um, with people that you love and and people you maybe never have met before. Like when I first started campaigning when I was like around your age, I went on like a Greyhound bus around the country with people I had never met who I'm still really good friends with now and yeah. keep in touch with. And, you know, and it was just such a wonderful experience for me to like meet people from all over that you never would have met before, but you really like are sort of, um, you're holding hands on things that really matter and it feels really important. And so you, would you just encourage everybody to do that? I mean, you're out with oh, some yeah. icons here in the world, but. That's how, um, I kind of fall into it. And I feel like everyone has that moment of like, I went to Iceland for three weeks with National Geographic to go across the island and understand like what was going on with it. And that was kind of my story of like, finally understanding that I gotta be an activist. But it was, it was, it's crazy to say that like, whenever I see Jane Fonda, it's like a running joke that she's my godmother. <laughs> like it's just that community that we build is so amazing. Like it just comes out the blue too. It just comes from like people seeing like a video or you seeing my post on Instagram and feeling powerful enough to, to support the work that I do. And it's, it's, I think that it starts from just like, just having an out of body experience. Like when I was in Iceland, we were on Bray the Merkur Yogel, which was the fastest melting glacier in the Iceland, Icelandic island. And right there, we saw the glacier melting right in front of us. Like we were on the glacier for five hours. In the span of five hours, we saw an entire chunk of it break off and start floating down to the river. And it was that understanding, like we were standing on a huge glacier and it was melting right in front of my eyes. And I was like, we have to stop this. Like a lot of people in Iceland were being detrimented by that and they couldn't farm anymore. And 
I came back to America like a different person, kind of. <laughs> and I was at, right after that, three days later, we organized the Youth Climate March, which was the first ever youth climate um, event that happened in 25 cities across the world. And the day after that, um, we did a youth climate summit where we met with over 300 elected officials to talk about signing a no fossil fuel money pledge. And it was that those sequence of events that really changed my perspective. I think that everyone should just go out of your own experience and try to understand someone else's perspective. Because when you step in someone else's shoes, you're like, yeah. I've been missing this entire understanding my entire life. And yeah. it changes you as a person. Mm -hmm. And like the, after that, that time, everything just kind of fell into to place. Like the day after that, I got an email. I was working the email um, list for a Sunrise Movement in, in Zero Hour. And they were, I was working and I got an email from Greta Thunberg saying, I just saw the work that you did for the um, Youth Climate March. And I'm thinking about this crazy idea for starting doing climate strikes um, every day. Um, back then it was every day. She wanted to do it every day. Um, and we transformed it to Friday. But she was like, we should do strike from school to really raise awareness of the fact that young people should sacrifice their education to safeguard our future. So it was that email that just really changed the world because at the time I got a lot of random emails like that. I was like, uh, being honest, when we saw the email, we were like, we had, a, we had a team call going over all the ideas and we saw the climate strike idea and we we're like, this doesn't seem effective. It's not gonna work. <laughs> and then like the next week we saw that like it was trending everywhere and then it was happening all across Europe. And we're like, we responded to the email. And we're like, we're down to, to help and support. You're not in fashion, but I know that you yeah. are a fan of fashion. I, I'm a huge fan of fashion. I love the Hunger Games. Oh, oh wow. Me too. I love the Hunger Games. <laughs> okay, you Greta, read it you know, all. Best friends are than. We both like are super fans of Hunger Games. Like Jennifer Lawrence, like Elizabeth Banks, like if we met them, we would flip. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, they need to get involved in uh, Prom yeah. at the Polls, honestly. Yes, they do, absolutely. Wow, okay, I love that Hunger Games is your, like, fashion reference. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Um, I love that. I love that. That's because, my style. I mean, That's my style. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever, like, connect the two, though, but I don't know. Fashion is kind of like the Hunger Games. Um, yeah, we're like Tatnus Everdeen, and, like, we're picking on an entire system, and we're, like, banding together the different districts around the world to create this movement. Like exactly that inspired like Greta Thunberg. Like me and Greta Thunberg both were like, oh, we love both of the Hunger Games. This is like I didn't even know this, <laughs> and we that's one of our movements. Like March for Our Lives, Hunger Games, Divergent. All these movies were like our inspiration. What role do you think fashion plays or should play in the future, if any? Yeah, I think that fashion actually has like a huge role because that's the first thing when we see when we see a person. It's like, what are you what are you wearing? What are you looking like? What are you presenting yourself as? And I think that fashion kind of changes as we go into this this next phase and making sure that it's sustainable and not just fast fashion, just like a continual like putting out of clothing every single week and having different seasons. I don't know if that's offensive. I'm sorry, but <laughs> no, that's not. Nothing offends me. Go for it. <laughs> but. I'm not saying you're fast fashion, but like some people in the industry are like that. But I think that yeah. really fashion has to change to be really in community. Like it has to be more like more down to earth and realistic to really be what someone would wear. And I think that comes down to denim. It comes down to what co what co type of cotton we use. Where do we source our cotton? Making sure we aren't using Uyghur labor that comes from Tibet and or the Uyghur province of, of China, or to make sure that like we aren't depleting entire rivers. Like in, in, in Turkmenistan, like an entire river was depleted because of our use of cotton, where we sourced it from. And I think that when we talk about fashion, we have to make sure it's sustainable and using plastic bottles that come up from the ocean and just things that are re generally reusable and not a detriment. Because fashion wow. is, the, is the third most polluting industry when it yes, comes it to is. climate change. So we have to change that. Lastly, I just want to reiterate, you're 18. All of the things that you have mentioned, I am not quite sure how you have fit into 18 years of life. At your age, I was still just like sitting on the couch eating chips and queso, haven't accomplished anything. <laughs> so uh, I think it's amazing. But during a time that has been really dark in the world, so many times I've told you this, I've gone on and looked at what you're doing. We have partnered together as a company with you uh, and One Million of Us. And I have been so inspired on, on days that I feel dark and days that I feel like, where are we going and what is happening? I look at the work that you and all of your friends are doing and it gives me such hope for the future. And I know that we are in the right hands 
And I am just lucky to be living at the same time as you. I just really, really want to thank you so much for the work that you were doing for the voice that you're putting out into the world and for your dedication. I think that for not ever giving up, for continuing to push the envelope and the boundaries and to speak to people with heart and empathy. Um, I feel very grateful and honored that you came on here. And I know so many people watching uh, are gonna feel the same way when they see your voice. Um, and beyond this YouTube interview, Jerome has his own YouTube channel um, that you can also check out and has so many great interviews that he's done over time that I watch pretty frequently. So I just wanna say a huge thank you. Um, I will be seeing you between now and the election because we'll be working together on some initiatives and just generally being excited about the um, opportunity to vote. Yeah. But I just wanna say very much, thank you, thank you, thank you, not only for taking the time, but educating me. And I really appreciate it. Wonderful, it's an honor to be here. And we'll be dressing you for prom at the polls. So I'll see you soon, right? Absolutely. <laughs>